we got seven o'clock. Let's go ahead and call this regular meeting for June 27th uh, for the Troutdale City Council to order. Uh, can we have roll call, please? Sure. Right, Sarah, let's go <laughs> Sure. Councilor Ritma? Here. Councilor Caswell? Here. Councilor One? Present. Councilor White? Here. Councilor Wittrin? Present. Councilor Glantz? Present. Mayor Lauer? Here. Thank you. Do we have any agenda updates, Ray? No, Mayor. They are at RIB tonight. All right. Sounds good. We'll move on to agenda item number two, public comment. Public comment on non-agenda and consent agenda items is welcome at this time. Public comment on agenda items will be taken at the time the item is considered. Public comment should be directed to the presiding officer and limited to matters of community interest or related to matters uh, which may or could come before council. Each speaker shall be limited to five minutes for each agenda item unless a different amount of time is allowed by the presiding officer with consent of the council. Council and mayor should avoid immediate or protracted responses to citizen comments. Public comment is open. Uh, let's go to Zoom first. If anybody on Zoom wishes to make public comment, go ahead and let's raise our hands and I will call on you accordingly. Okay, not seeing anybody. Anybody in council chambers wishes to make public comment? Now is the time. Go ahead and approach the dev table. State your name and city of residence for the record. All right, not seeing anybody. I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. We'll move on to agenda item number three a motion to approve the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission's 2023 2024 annual budget and report on Mount Hood Cable Regulation Committee and Metro East. Mr. Norm Thomas, uh, John Lugton, Seth Ring, Christy Manseth, and Rebecca Gibbons from uh, Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission and Metro East. Just Mr. Norm Thomas. Oh, I think the other ones are online. Oh, yep, I see them now. <laughs> Give me a second to get organized here and I'll be yeah, good to go. Absolutely. Christine. Christy, I see Christy. I see Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca's in the bottom right corner of where I'm seeing. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to come before you tonight and uh, say hello to counselors and staff, some of which I already I know. So I need to pull this over a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit closer might help a little bit. Okay. There and it's go. active, right? Yep. Red means hot. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't see it with the button in the way. I know. I can't. <laughs> oh, mine was off. All right. Well, let's start out with the. What I'll do is I'll start out with my presentation and then we'll move into a presentation by <clears throat> our agency that we had do the evaluation of our tech smart impact program, the report, which we gave away somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million to help support schools, especially in the tech technology area. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. You're not commissioners here, so my name is Norm Thomas, your appointed representative on the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. I'm here today to seek your approval for the MHCRC 23-24 fiscal year budget and to highlight you on some of the on some of the some of the MHCRC's planned activities for the coming year. As a reminder, the MHCRC, which I'd rather just call the commission if that's all right with you guys. Absolutely. Is a regional commission representing the cities of Fairview, Gresham, Portland, the most important, Trotdale. Wood Village and Multnomah County. The commission was formed in 1992 through an intergovernmental agreement to provide oversight, enforcement, and public benefits responsibility under the cable services franchise. The commission is a group of eight volunteers appointed by the cities and the county. The cities appoint, well, Portland appoints three members and each, other, each of the other jurisdictions appoint one member each as we are staffed through a service staff service agreement with the city of Portland. The jurisdictions currently have cable television franchise agreements with Zipply Fiber, which serves East County and Comcast. 
which serves the countywide. Over the years, the Commission has monitored the changing technologies and public policy landscape to support community needs for local authority over the public rights of way and compensation for its use by for profit cable companies. A consumer watchdog to assist subscribers with billing and service issues and local solutions for addressing local representation in media and digital equity issues. Each year we present, present the Commission's adopted budget to each jurisdiction for approval. This is also an opportunity to share with you in more detail the services we provide provided over the past year and to answer any questions you might you may have. The Commission voted unanimously to recommend approval of the 23-24 budget at our meeting on May 22nd. In your meeting packet, you have the proposed budget, our annual report, and goals for next year, and the TechSmart Initiative Impact Report, which you will hear more about from Christy in just a few minutes. I'll take the next few minutes to provide an overview of the proposed budget and some of our planned activities for the coming year. <laughs> the proposed budget of the fiscal 23-24 budget is on page five of the budget document. Nearly all of the MHCRC funds and resources are funded and collected by the cable companies and the expenditures are dispersed by those to those funds to the members to the jurisdictions member jurisdictions. The community media providers Metro East and Open Signal and community grant recipients recipients. Long term trends continue to reflect a slow decline in the number of cable subscribers as more and more people receive their media content in other ways. The franchise fees collected are calculated based on a percentage of gross profit, the gross profit revenues, which is 5%. So drops in subscriber counts continue to be slightly offset by the annual rate increases implemented by the providers. After funding Metro East and the commission's operating budget, the city trial deal is projected, projected to receive about $40,736. And maybe there's some sense added in there. From the franchise fees next year, the projection is less is fi about 5,000 less than last year. Through the, though the intergovernmental agreement allows each juris, each jurisdiction agrees to fund a portion of the MHCR's operating budget. Couldn't stay put together today. <laughs> The city's allocation to the commission's operating budget for 2324 is $21,606. Combined with the contributions from the other jurisdictions, the total operating budget is $545,734. The, pro the proposed budget includes a slight, slight increase in staffing this year from 4 FTE to 4.9. We are using the carrier funds from this fiscal year due to staff vacancies to support an additional full-time employee. Our staffs are tasked with conducting cable franchise agreements and compliance, fielding consumer complaints, overseeing the commission meetings and finances, and implement, implementing public benefit programs, such as the grant program to support technology use in schools, community nonprofit, and other, and our two community media centers, Metro East Community Media in Gresham and Open Signal in Portland. Funding also supports support limited professional services such as legal counsel, advocacy work, and participation in, ag in national organizations. In, the, in the, the coming year, we are kicking off a strategic planning process for member jurisdictions to engage with us to develop a strategy for addressing involving public policy and community needs. We will be reaching out to, you, out to each jurisdiction in the coming months to have these discussions. With the resources collected through the franchise, the Commission provides capital and operating support to Metro East Community Media and Open Signal, two vital community based organizations that work to assure that our communities have access to media technology, training, and diverse local engaging video content on the cable system. Metro East is on, they also broadcast the uh, Trout Hill city, city meetings. As we, and we provide capital grants to schools, libraries, public agencies, and community nonprofits to support access to technology and training that promotes civic engagement, equity, and economic opportunity. The Commission anticipates awarding $2 million in community technology grants in the coming year. 
The summary of grants awarded last year is included in the annual report included in your meeting packet. Today, I'd like, it, I'd like to focus on the funding initiative that, can, that the Commission recently wrapped up. You may recall that since 2014, we have been funding innovative classroom technology grants through a strategic partnership with each of the six school districts in the county. The grants were designed to use technology and innovative teaching and learning techniques to achieve better academic outcomes for students. The TechSmart initiative invested nearly $16 million, I was a little off, $16 million since its inception. It was cut short of its goal, of its goal to invest a total of $19 million due to federal law change under the previous administration that took effect in 2019. The commission in partnership with outside professional evaluation team has spent the last couple of years closing out the projects and working with the districts to assess the impact and to share what we've learned. Here today was Christy Manthes, Manthes with Pacific Research and Evaluation to share the findings. Christy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm gonna, I have a few slides to share with you all, so I'm gonna share my screen and just let me know if there's any problem. Sorry, there we go. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Okay, sorry about that. Here's my presentation. So um, thank you for letting me come and um, share with you some of the ways that the funding from the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission has been supporting school districts over the last um, seven year TechSmart initiative. So as was mentioned, um, my company Pacific Research and Evaluation has been a research partner in this work throughout the entire grant um, process. And so we've had the opportunity to, to talk with the schools and um, look at student achievement data to see kind of the impact of this funding um, on, on the district. So I'm just going to give you guys some highlights of information. I know you guys have the full impact report that we put together in front of you that you can dig into a little bit more. Um, but I'll just talk, talk about some of the things that I think have been has been pretty interesting. So as we just heard, there um, was a nearly $16 million in funds awarded. And um, the real goal of these grants was to try to support districts in not only supplying the technology into the schools, but also um, really providing a professional development element to teachers to, to, to really see a change in instructional strategies that incorporate technology. So this looked a lot like um, several different types of devices and apps, but also different types of um, professional development models integrated into the classrooms, different um, coaches that were employed um, to support teachers in really trying to change their instruction using the technology. Um, and I'll talk about a few of the ways that we saw that happen through our research. But six school districts were funded through the grants and nine total grants were awarded. So a couple of the districts, um, including David Douglas, Reynolds, Gresham Barlow had um, two projects each um, for about three years each. So um, some of those were extension projects and some of them were completely different focus depending on the district. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of the things in this presentation today that I thought um, really stood out um, from the TechSmart grants and um, how this funding really allowed the districts to do things with technology that they really wouldn't have been able to do if this, um, uh, this amount of funding wasn't provided to them. Um, so the first thing is that it really allowed districts to take some big risks that they maybe wouldn't have taken if they didn't have this type of funding. Um, they were able to try new technologies. They were able to try new instructional strategies um, and different PD formats using this funding. So there's a couple of examples here. I can focus on the second one, which was in Reynolds. Um, they were really able to, um, one of the things that they did is they funded expensive technology like 3D printers and short throw projectors for their math classrooms that really 
were engaging to the students, but also they um, tried some instructional models like a flipped classroom, which I don't know if you all are familiar with, but it's kind of a way that um, teachers are able to record themselves providing instruction. Um, students watch the lectures at home and then um, kind of have a little more hands-on facilitation from the teachers in the classroom. Um, and some of the, the technology was able to really make that happen. Um, we also wanted to highlight the fact that the TechSmart, it was very wonderful in preparing districts and schools that were receiving the funding for the pandemic. Um, nobody could have ever anticipated that that would happen and that, you know, all schools would eventually be using um, tech in the classroom. Um, but we saw that students were more familiar with Google Classroom and Seesaw, which is a common app that was used in the districts during um, distance learning. Um, we heard that students knew how to use their Chromebooks already. Teachers had established Google Classrooms. They knew how to embed videos and links in their classroom content. Um, and then because they had a lot of this basic knowledge, they were able to really use more sophisticated tools during the pandemic. Um, also important to point out that students were able to easily um, log into devices, which although it seems like a straightforward task is kind of challenging for younger students, um, which um, kind of was an obstacle that had already been tackled by the time this TechSmart district got to that point. Um, I also just wanted to point out that TechSmart was really at the forefront of digital equity. There was an equity aspect of the TechSmart grants from the very beginning. Um, a lot of districts focused on high need schools. Um, we also saw that digital access became a real priority during the pandemic. So um, I think that we heard that the pandemic really forced districts, you know, not just in our state, but across the country to see that giving the students a device doesn't necessarily provide them access. Um, and being prepared with devices really allowed the districts to focus more on access and making sure that hotspots could become available, um, really being creative about spending time on how to get students access. Um, and that's pretty, it ties in well to my next point, which is just that we saw a lot about how um, technology in the classroom was really increasing equity um, for students because everybody was having access. Um, but when the distance learning with the pandemic came across along, um, we did see a little bit of inequities, um, again, due to the, the access issue. I'll keep us moving. Just wanted to highlight a couple of cool um, student achievement findings that happened or that we saw in our research, I will say that we were pretty limited in being able to look at student achievement data, mostly because um, students didn't take the state test during two of the key years of our of the grant cycle um, due to the pandemic. But we were able to look at some descriptive um, achievement data. And um, this is another wonderful thing, I think, about the design of the TechSmart project from the MHCRC. They really asked districts to um, focus on some of the, they, part, they did a support of the All Hands Raise partnership and there were 12 community-wide indicators that um, are part of, were part of that partnership. And so the districts had to really focus on one or more of them. Most of the TechSmart districts were either looking at kindergarten readiness, um, third grade reading outcomes, eighth grade math, ninth grade credit attainment and graduation rates. Um, my organization developed a quasi-experimental student achievement study for each district I uh, was able to somewhat execute that um, prior to the pandemic, but um, it didn't work so much after the pandemic due to the fact that my treatment, my control group uh, all got the treatment during distance learning and, and so it was all washed out. But um, we saw some promising findings and we're able to look at things in a different way. Um, this actually just goes over those limitations. So. I'll just focus on a couple of cool things that we saw um, in the Reynolds School District. We were able to look at some promising results prior to the pandemic. So the first two cohorts, um, Reynolds focused on um, middle school math in their first grant. And they, we saw that um, even by seventh grade, the first two TechSmart cohorts had earned um, a significantly higher number of math credits on average than their historical comparison group. So we compared them to students um, historically. Um, and that actually held up when we look at underserved student subgroups as well. So that was students of color, special education students and English language learners. They also showed significantly higher math credit attainment than their historical comparison group. So that was a promising early finding in TechSmart. Um, and it actually held up over time as well. And then I'll just highlight one more from Gresham Barlow. Um, this is the first grant that Gresham Barlow implemented. So I tried to 
pretty much focus on things that happened prior to the pandemic because it was less messy. Um, but you can see this is their first cohort of students um, in a TechSmart school compared to a non-TechSmart school. We matched um, by school. And um, the line graphs just show the percentage who are of students who are meeting the reading benchmarks um, at first, second, and third grade. Um, and you can see that the TechSmart cohort started uh, slightly higher than the comparison and um, kind of stayed that way over the course of the, um, the project and in, in that gap kind of increased um, over time. And so the last thing I'll say is people always are asking from our research, what's next for education technology? Where can the money be spent next um, now that every school is kind of going one-to-one -one on devices or a lot of them are? Um, and when I talked to the districts about this, there was a lot of discussion around really reframing the traditional role of the teacher. So kind of going back to that example I gave you of the flipped classroom, um, so many were discussing just teachers as facilitators being able to interact with students more using the technology for um, other purposes to try to um, get more one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, there was discussion around intentional use of applications. Um, I think when, when, uh, when the schools were first using apps during the pandemic, there was a lot of let's use anything we can get our hands on. And now there's a lot more research and, and focus on deciding what is used. Um, uh, along with that goes just ensuring that um, apps that are used and, and applications are really um, keeping student data private. Um, and so there's a lot of work going on around that. And then just the continued maintenance and, and innovation um, is what I heard at the end. So um, I know that was really quick. I'm really appreciative of you all listening to um, what I learned during these seven years. This was amazing. I'm the biggest TechSmart cheerleader out there. Um, I could talk for hours, but I know you don't have that much time. So um, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Christy. Is there any questions for Christy? Yeah, any questions from the council? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Norm. Thank it turned you, out Christy. to be a far better program. You know, when we came up with the idea, we wanted to see if there was some way to move the needle to help out students. And then we, you know, made, a, made an allocation that let's take X amount of funds and move it forward to see if, it, to see if we can make this work. Mm -hmm. And the staff worked very closely with all the school districts and the school districts, you know, put a lot of work into getting just everything ready to go and other to actually use it and make it work. And fortunately, it helped them out with the pandemic. Was it the plan? Never was. Don't want it to be. <laughs> but it did help out because people are a lot of teachers had gotten where they understood how to use technology, which was a side benefit. All right. Now I'd like to invite staff from Metro East to share a few words. I think David's going to talk to us. Hello. That's right. I've also got a short presentation. Um, good evening, Mayor, Councilors. Thank you, Norm and Christy and Rebecca. Appreciate you. Uh, get this started here. I don't know if you have any trouble seeing that. Thanks for having me. Um, over the past year, we've moved our executive style to one of shared leadership. We've also worked towards creating a new strategic plan, and we've worked to have a new agreement with the MHCRC. We feel that by pulling these components together, we've created a very pragmatic budget and a realistic plan for the future. This is our mobile media lab financed through a community technology grant. With it, we can teach filmmaking, podcasting, and digital storytelling, and a whole lot more. And we can now meet people where they're at. And that is very important to the residents of East County. We get to meet youth and families at community events. As you can see from the I Heart Rockwood event, a very positive experience. Uh, we've partnered with the Rockwood Library to deliver YouTube and TikTok camps. And we've also uh, worked with the uh, Gresham Summer Kids in the Park program to bring some fun and technology to those hot summer days. We're also active in media education and literacy at Gresham High School and Gordon Russell Middle School using simple tools that introduce a world of opportunity. Regarding digital literacy, with introduction to computers seen here at Rosewood Initiative, we're working with 
all women groups of Rohingya, Latinx, and Nepali. These digital skills to an immigrant, refugee, or low-income person are vital to being successful. We view digital access as a utility that everyone should have access to. These are pictures from our newly introduced cohort model, where we've just finished our first two, uh, two groups uh, with the uh, Center of, for Positive Aging and uh, Life Skills Oregon. With cohorts, we've seen very strong attendance, and it really allows us to mission align our work with our nonprofits. In addition to cohorts, we continue to receive a lot of community programs, much of which is hyperlocal and relevant. With channels, these channels were vital during COVID, where we were able to get messages out to the community very quickly. We also provide a bulletin board, which offers many nonprofits a non-commercial advertising solution. With government meetings, we cover over 200 a year, over 350 hours of programming. During COVID, we didn't miss a beat or a meeting, and we have helped some of our jurisdictions with HB 2560 integration, enabling online participation in regular city council meetings. We are currently in the process of increasing the number of captioned programs on our channels. 5% of the world's population are deaf or hard of hearing, and Oregon has 24% hearing loss, second among all states. Also, about 80% of the general population are using captions regularly. Our Emmy-nominated production department continues to work with schools, government agencies, and local nonprofits to deliver their message. With Food Foray, we explore East County's food diversity. In Follow the Water, we featured Judy Blue Horse a native, and, and other Native voices as well uh, as we tell a story of our connection, disconnection, and reconnection to water. Follow the Water was shown at the Portland Echo Film Fest. We also made a series of lawn care videos with an environmental focus. This was a statewide, uh, statewide collaborative project with over 60 nonprofits and government agencies involved. We'd like to share our most sincere thanks to you, the MHCRC and the city of Troutdale, and of course, our other municipalities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any, take any questions if you have some. Thanks. Yeah, if anybody has questions for David, now's the time. Not seeing any. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Well, okay. thank you. Yeah, I want to wanted to personally thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and City Administrator Ray Young, for allowing us to have the extra time to present this. Normally, we just come up here and just give a short spiel, and away we go. But anyway, anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, <clears throat> Norm, how long have you been our representative? I sat down and tried to count it up. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it was, I think I got on it in 1995. So whatever that adds wow. up to. So what, 18 years? I just wanted to thank you for that. And that's usually why we don't have any questions either because we, we know Norm so well and trust what he has to say. So at least that's what it is for me. Well, once in a while it's good to question me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Norm uh, graciously accepted uh, the appointment. So again, for Ninth, the 19th going on the 19th year maybe um, well, i think it's a three-year term so it'd be yeah. more than that <laughs> yeah so uh thank you for helping east county uh mm -hmm. dealing with this this uh important technology uh, uh commission and keeping this information coming we need it our schools need it oh absolutely so. it's it's you know the program that funded that the 19 million came out of the extra three percent yeah because there's you know, there's a five percent basic um, franchise fee, mm -hmm. and then through the contract or the franchise, you have an extra three percent. Essentially, one percent of that goes to help out the two um, community media centers, mm -hmm. and then the other two percent we provided for grants, and it racks up to a fair amount of money. Yeah, and so what we did was we cut part of that out specifically to take care of the tech smart. While, while still maintaining some of our community access grants, yeah, which made it really nice. So, I did have one question, and um, actually, let's go to Councillor Glantz first. 
Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, I was a little curious in looking through how some of the funding was split up. Is it based on, so a couple scenarios, let's say that there is a multifamily unit and they supply cable, are they counted as one or would they be counted as 20 units? And on that same question, if I have Comcast for cable and Zipply for fiber, am I counted as two subscribers? How does that kind of split up when you're talking about subscribers and percent of population and percent of? Well, we count cable subscribers only. Okay. That's, that's what we regulate. The, uh, the actual fiber for internet access and all that stuff that's in broadband is all regulated you know, basically by the FCC. And we don't have any direct control over that. Although more and more systems are using you know, broadband internet to deliver the cable system. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, except for the multifamily part. Is that considered a single account or multiple accounts? I think, free? I'm not exactly sure on that because a lot of the multifamily units have a separate contract with, okay. with Comcast or whoever the provider is. And then they you know, figure it out from there. So I've, my guess is it might be just counted as one, but that's just, that's just a guess. Okay, thank you, great presentation. Thank you. All right. Any, Any other, other comments or questions? Uh, I am going to open it up to public comment really quick before we sure. entertain the motion. So, okay. um, let's if there's no other comments or questions from council. All right, let's go ahead and open public comment. Public comments open on agenda item number three: a motion to approve the MHCRC 2023-2024 annual budget. <laughs> Uh, and the report from MHCRC and Metro East. Anybody wishing to make comment? Now is the time. On Zoom, let's start on Zoom. Uh, if you could go ahead and raise your hand, and then I'll call on you and unmute and state your name and city of residence for the record. Okay, not seeing anybody on Zoom. Anybody in council tonight wishes to make a comment? All right, not seeing anybody. Let's close public comment. <laughs> If there's nothing else from council and nothing else from Norm or, or uh, Christy or, or David, I'll entertain a motion. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll move adoption of the motion to approve the Mount Hood, Regula Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission's 2023-2024 annual budget. Second. Seconded by Councilor One. Wittrin. Wittrin. Or Wittrin, sorry. <laughs> W's. Yeah. White, which one's all the same. White, which one's one. Councilor Caswell. Yes. Councilor One. Yes. Mayor Lauer. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Wittrin. Yes. Councilor Glantz. Yes. And Councilor Ritma. Yes. All right, it passes. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Norm. I appreciate it. And again, like I did you, echo did what you wanna, did counts. you want to move the nomination or do you want to just let me sit in limbo land? <laughs> <laughs> it is. I did offer to 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 Ray Young to, you know, not do it. He said, I'm going to come find you. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. essentially what he said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I, I appreciate you uh, being our representative again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Christy. Appreciate your uh, input and, and your work as well. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to agenda item number four, a public hearing and second introduction of an ordinance adopting the City of Troutdale Parks Master Plan and amending the Comprehensive Land Use Plan Goal 8 to include modifications to the summary overview, reference to the 2023 Parks Master Plan, and a new list of policies. Mr. Berniker. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Ready, Sarah? I'm nearly there. <laughs> Microphone's on? Yes. Microphone's yes. on. All right. Let's get a screen share here. Things are in my way here. Okay.
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm David Berniker, Director of Community Development. Um, the following is the second council meeting um, with the first hearing um, happening on occurring on June 13th. The request this evening is to adopt the City of Troutdale Park Master Plan and by doing so update the comprehensive land use plan. Approval of the approved, uh, proposed plan does not require any particular addition or change to our park system. The plan is primarily used to identify potential improvements in our park system that would be desirable and, and allow those projects to, to be part of our long range plans and grant requests. It's important, and I mentioned this last time, to note that implementation of any item in the plan would require council approval throughout the land, throughout the budget process. Next. The current master plan um, was adopted 15 years ago in 2006. The parks master plan, as we call the plan, update is a long-term plan for the city of Troutdale Parks and Recreation System. It's a 20-year plan. The plan sets the direction for the park system based on community values and needs and a comprehensive analysis of current challenges and future opportunities. The plan sets forth a unified vision with recommendations and strategies. Next. The plan is based on a community needs as well as existing and adopted plans and policies, including the city's comprehensive plan, town center plan, and others as shown up on the screen. Next. Staff and a consultant team have been working with the Parks Advisory Committee and City Council since the fall of 2021, resulting in the Parks Advisory Commission recommending adoption of the plan this spring. On May 24, 2023, Planning Commission recommended adoption of the plan and forwarded to City Council. On June 13, 2023, the Troutdale City Council held the first public hearing to consider adoption of the park's master plan. After closing the public hearing, the City Council directed staff to remove the sentence dealing um, with the Glen Auto Park master plan, which calls for potential repurposing of existing picnic areas south of the site to camping. The adoption parks master plan realizes, realizes this and there, the, the mention of camping from the plan has been removed. Next. This brings me to the staff recommendation, which is a staff recommends adopting the revised parks master plan and adopting the proposed amendments to the city of Troutdale's comprehensive plan goal eight. And that's my presentation, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Berniker. Uh, comments or questions from Council? Councilor Glantz. I have one small request that makes this a lot easier for me to swallow. Uh, and it's on page 52, where we show the uh, 9.3 million we're looking to potentially spend in the next five years. I'm hoping in the very bottom where we talk about all costs shown are in 2022 uh, dollars uh, costs shown in table have been updated from source i would like it to also say this amount includes grant funding so it's not like the city of trapdale is necessarily looking to spend 9.2 million but our project costs from all sources would be 9.2 million that's just my opinion I, I, I kind of agree with that too. But like a lot of that's grant funding. Yeah, it doesn't. We don't have to say how much or anything else. Just that that amount would include grant funding. So in the italicized asterisk down at the bottom. Yep. Can do that. Yep. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Glantz. Uh, any other comments or questions from the council? Councilor White? Yeah, I've got to bear with me because I've got about eight. Well, let's, let's dig into it. Take them in order. <laughs> um, on page 17, under goal three, natural areas. 3.1 talks about identify areas of environmental significance, wetlands, sensitive species, and habitat to be fully protected from development. Now, but we're also at the same time in this plan talking about building trails in, in those same areas. 
So it's kind of a, a double standard. So I think we I think we should remove that because we are going to be utilizing that area for like the Beaver Creek Trail is a great example. It's in the floodplain. It's definitely a sensitive uh, area, but yet we're proposing to build a, a trail through there. And also, whenever we are talking about um, these natural areas, I assume according to the map, we're talking about city owned property. We're not talking about someone that might own um, property that that is in the floodplain. That, that is would correct. fall under separate rules. Okay. Yes. So we don't really need to mention that because it's covered on the map. That is correct. Okay. Well, on this one, I think we we should probably just delete that. Is what, if, what if we added when possible? Because I think it's still important to say that we have economic significant, you know, or environmental significance is important. It says environmental significance. Be fully protected from development when possible. And I don't think, I mean, it says, correct, I identify areas, correct so. me if I'm wrong, but um, Mr. Berniker and Ray, the trail exists. It's getting revitalized. The bridge is getting. Now we're talking about the um, across from the RV park. Um, it's in this plan. So it would go from Depot Park all the way to Glen. Oh, so Island not park. the Beaver Creek Trail. It, you're, there's sections of you're talking about a different section yeah. that is developed. This is a brand new and proposed connection. There by my we are Mayor. We are currently working with Metro um, and other owners to uh, acquire access to property on the west side of Beaver Creek between Depot and Glen Auto, with the hope that at some point there would be a uh, pedestrian trail that would connect the depot by cub terminus of the sandy river trail to a nicer and easier place to walk down to glen auto from the depot correct um, my confusion yeah. was we haven't named that trail yet and no. so when we mentioned beaver creek trail i was under the impression yeah, that we were talking yeah, about you could call it trail, trail but it's the one between depot okay. and glen auto i think is what councillor white's referring yeah, and it's to in this plan so that's why yeah. i thought it counterdicts can I ask sure. a question real quick? Sure. So this to me says this is a goal of these of these areas is to identify areas of environmental significance. So we don't have to say that that's environmentally significant to okay. us at this point. It just says we should. To me, how I read this is is we should look at identify some areas, leave those areas alone, but that shouldn't impact any projects that we have. Is that unless there unless I'm missing something? Is that I don't I know think if you that, could provide context. I think to that. that was our reading of it that identifies gave you the okay. room and he, and as I said in the beginning, Councillor, um, any decision that happens along Park's property is something that has to go before you. So yeah. there's that kind of blanket coverage that you all have moving forward. The plan just sets for ideas of things to think about moving forward for the next twenty years. Okay. Um, maybe like Sandy suggested, we're we're applicable. We may have that language. And may I jump in here? Hi, I'm Cindy Mendoza, Director of Park and Recreation Planning at MIG. Uh, if, if possible, I can offer some clarification. I uh, yeah, go ahead, Cindy. Thank you for being here. Uh, of course, um, one of the suggestions I may make is is part of the wording here that may be creating problems is to be fully protected. So I feel like we could simply say identify areas of environmental significance, wetlands, sensitive species and habitat to minimize impacts associated with new development where applicable. That sounds fantastic. That did sound fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> We'll make that change. Thank you, Cindy. And then for this next one on, on page 18, I do need to declare a potential conflict of interest because I own I own property along that proposed trail area. But um, I, I'm just going to throw this out anyway. I'm one vote, so I think it's 
if you know someone has a problem with me stating it, I'll go ahead. Um, is in, like at Sunrise Park and stuff when we have a trail like that, and I'm familiar with that area. It's a very narrow strip between the creek and then the, there's eight adjacent property owners. They're going to have this new trail going basically through their back back area. And uh, I'm just suggesting that we include money for a, a fence that would uh, separate the private property from the, the public trail. And I know they do that at Sunrise Park and Spring Water Corridor and other um, places like that. That's something that we can consider um, as council okay. when that. Wait till it. Yeah. Okay. That's absolutely something we can take up with Ray. Uh, absolutely. That, this is still in the early stages of discussion yeah. with um, Metro and assisting in acquiring the rest of the property. The city already owns half the property between Depot um, and Glen Auto, and we're working to get easements and or ownership of parcels along there. And so we're looking a couple years down the road, and we're, we don't even have anything designed. I mean, right. when we get to that point, Definitely the Parks Advisory Committee will be involved in the design process. Community Outreach will be involved in the design process so that uh, concerns uh, such as Councilor White's will be definitely considered in yeah. the process. Okay. And then on page 39, oh, never mind. We got that one covered. It's on the map. It was about, just talking about natural areas. I thought it'd be good to have on city owned property. And then on the next page, page 40, the very last paragraph there, update park system development. To me, this feels a little bit like scope creep because, you know, that should be a, a budget budget decision when they're actually calling out, you know, dollar amounts on page 41, how much to budget for. So I feel like that that's that's really not parks decision that's a a budget committee decision i don't want to get locked in i believe i believe this is what it's asking it's asking for an update to the park system sdcs and so i don't think it's locking in a certain number i believe it's just recommending that we move not move forward that we consider updating the park SDC. Yeah, I think okay. that's right, Mayor. I mean, everything in this is just a consideration. Right. There's nothing right. written in stone. It's what staff and the consultant okay. kind of put forward with the Parks Advisory Committee of, you know, of the breadth of projects and ideas that could be coming your way. Again, in your purview to decide what to do with them when the time is appropriate. The one thing that, I mean, I'm looking through this paragraph and I look for, I call them soft words like should instead of okay Good concrete enough. words like shall or must <laughs> scary words yeah well, okay. what if we just added the word consider in front of the subheads so consider increasing park and facility maintenances consider updating park S system sdc's yeah. on that highlighted or i'm sorry that emboldened uh, mm -hmm. title consider update park system SDCs mm -hmm. and consider increase uh, park and facility maintenance staffing levels because that makes it more of a something to review here's what they recommend is that you know then it can go into a full process not what this whole thing is is a consideration like yeah you know, sometimes it's nice to call that out especially when yeah, as was mentioned before we have words like would instead of should mm -hmm. scary words I agree. Again, uh, Cindy Mendoza at MIG. I think the intent here is to create a document that allows you the flexibility to make decisions that are appropriate at the time these projects go forward. At the same time, this is uh, intended to give you good data for decision making. So it, it points out where you may need additional maintenance dollars or may want to consider increasing your SDCs to be able to fund some of these projects. So I, I do like the suggestion of adding consider in front of it, just as an acknowledgement that this will come back to council to make decisions going forward. Mayor, if I might direct to page 37, which is the opening 
paragraph for all those next several pages to talk about it. it it does say these provide broad direction and policy guidance for all aspects of the plan and based on these goals and their supporting policies the following recommendations provide more specific direction so the, the heading paragraph for the next three or four pages we're talking about is clearly labeled recommendations and actually that's what i was going to say so well you should have been faster <laughs> well, <you should> have <laughs> been <faster. laughs> Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I hear what uh, Councillor Glance and Councillor White are saying, but I think it is, it's, I, I see it written as clearly that it is recommendations okay. and not, not written in stone, as is. I do appreciate what you're saying, but thank you, Rish. Sure. Yeah, I'm almost done here. Um, so now I'm on, it doesn't have a page number, I'm in the funding what's uh, the um, it's on other recreational opportunities it's the second to the last paragraph starting with the columbia river is an underutilized recreational resource is it in, in the, the appendices area. where are you counselor so the list of policies will be in place with a list of goals and objectives let me see the page this is um, in the appendix, but I went through the whole thing. So mm -hmm. I, I just curious what page we're on. I'm not sure. No page number. Oh. It always makes it difficult. It looks like the staff report. Part of the, it's the very last few pages. It's talking about the master plan. Exhibit B. I just had a question about. And the only reason why I think it's in the staff report is because it's got um, it's got uh, redacted sentences on it, and I don't think they're going to have redacted sentences in this master plan. Uh, exhibit B. Yes, Exhibit B. There we go. Exhibit B after the appendices, after Appendix F, funding options. Um, last page. Is that what you said, Councillor White? No, it's not the last page. It's, um, exhibit B would be the one to third, third page. What's the first paragraph on that page? It says the Columbia River is an underutilized recreational resource in the Troutdale area. There are other recreational opportunities in the middle? Yeah. Has everyone got it? No. This is actually the comprehensive plan language. Anything that was there previously remains unless it is uh, redacted, which tells you what would be deleted, or underlined, which tells you what would be added. The other language that you're referencing was there previously. I see it now. Yeah, yeah I, I just had a question because it's talking about a boat ramp on Sundial, a private boat ramp on Sundial Road that I don't think uh, exists any longer. I think it's now Knife River. Oh. But it says north of Troutdale, so that's what threw me off. The Sun Sundial Road is, is in Troutdale. I mean, we used to have a boat ramp there. And I'm the one always advocating for that as a, really the most potential uh, for Troutdale, even if we had to do something like our attorney suggested at some time that we partner with um, Grand Ron where they have a lot more flexibility to, to do like fishing piers and docks. So I'm wondering if that shouldn't be part of this plan that we pursue, pursue that because that green section of land up there in Troutdale to me is just a wasted opportunity. And it's an area I'd love to, to be able to utilize myself. I, I'm sorry, man. It, 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 I understand what you're saying. And I, you've said that many times and we appreciate that, but isn't that what the plan is saying? Identifying that it is unutilized and we should consider it for yeah. future it's recreation. It's not really mentioned in the plan, though. It's, it's only in this uh, yeah, appendix. It's, uh, yeah, that's it, absolutely a, a, a good goal and idea that we should Maybe that's maximize as best we can. But I thought that's kind of what it says. I was glad to see it, believe me. But um, yeah. where are we? It's... it's um, just 
Uh, there isn't any patient. It's immediately after Appendix F, funding options. And it goes into Exhibit B, uh, Attachment E, Comprehensive Land Use Plan, Goal 8 Update, and then you keep going down until you get to Other Recreational Opportunities. And it's the second to last paragraph on that page. And it starts with the Columbia River is an under under underutilized recreational resource in the Troutdale area. River access is provided by a private boat launch north of Troutdale off of Sundale Road and a public boat ramp in Fairview. Recreational use of the Columbia River in Troutdale is relatively limited at this time, so it's agreeing with you. The city recognizes the potential for development of this area for recreational needs. So I believe it's saying that. I believe it's saying that the city understands that the need is there. And I believe that gives us this, this plan, gives us the opportunity to explore those options. Okay. And I think this paragraph solidifies that in the way I'm reading it. Am I somewhat correct? Yeah. That's how, but. Okay. okay. And then it, just some, a few general comments. Um, you know, the plan talks about areas that are underserved and, you know, I'd have to argue with a, a city the size of Troutdale, five, five square miles. We have 22 parks, uh, not counting College Park, that is 88 acres, and uh, all the trails, and, and Beaver Creek Canyon, and then all the properties that, that are all the parks that border our city that are huge, like Lewis and Clark Park, the Columbia River Gorge, you know that. I don't think there's a single underserved area in uh -oh. Troutdale. Uh oh, Councilor Glantz. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, how'd you know that? <laughs> uh, College Park, uh, most of that is actually Mount Hood Community College and not park. The Mount Hood Community College kindly turns the other way, but that property is not park property. And Councilor Glantz has um, made more than one comment that her neck of the neck of woods is uh, underutilized. The only proper park we have, you can't even use during school hours because it's adjacent to a school playground and they kick you off. Mm -hmm. And it's, well, in the street, that brings up the street and the 15 acres that, that isn't mentioned. Is that because we don't actually own it yet? But we know we are eventually going to own it. It probably Wait, because we, we do. I would love to know this for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I will. I believe it's because we do not own it. <laughs> okay, so that's important to keep in mind. But I guess yeah. we got to let that one go. But I think I was under the the understanding that Metro owns College Park. Mm -mm. Only Maybe. that corner. Yeah, it's just I'll maybe look. an acre or two. It's pretty small. Yeah. Well, it looks like they are doing some improvements out there. Anyway. I did see that too. I was pretty excited. Good. So. I just thought it, it sounded bad for our city when we are the A student in parks. You know, Wood Village has one park. I think, how many does Gresham have? Oh, Three? I have no idea. And they have a city with a population of 100,000. They do have a lot of parks, but. Uh, I think it's a product of walking distance of a five minute walk, not necessarily number of parks. So it's just, um, it's acknowledged that I think the city does have a healthy number of parks. That doesn't mean that they're all within radius, a short walking radius of where people reside. So that's what it's sort of suggesting. Yeah, I'll say that presentation that we had last council meeting, it mm -hmm. showed, I mean, for lack of a better term, a park desert in South Troutdale <laughs> near Councillor uh, Glantz's, uh, like I said, neck of the woods. So nothing within a 10 minute, I think, was it 10 minute or? 30 yeah, minutes. Yeah, about 10 minutes to get to the school, assuming that I can even get to that, but yeah. Yeah. So then if, well, I got my last comment. Yep. Um, it okay. talks about planting trees and stuff, but I remember we had these professional consultants came in and toured our town and advised us, and it was from a grant. And they they were telling us not to block our, our vistas and our views with more trees. In fact, they were even saying we're, we're blocking some really spectacular views. So I would just want the parks department to be aware of where they plant to not to not block any of our, our views of like Broughton's Bluff, for example, and there's many others. 
because I agreed with the consultants and I think the rest of the council did as well. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor White. I appreciate it. Any other comments or questions from council? Uh, Councillor Ritma. On uh, page 21, 7.4, this is under funding and partnership. Medicate the revenues from disposed parks, park properties to improve the existing park system or develop parks in underserved areas. I, I, I could not support that statement and I didn't notice it before, but um, I don't agree with disposing of park property, period. And I don't want it in here. I don't even want it there. So I suggest we delete 7.4 and renumber the others. Dedicate the revenues from disposed park properties. I don't want I don't want to dispose of park properties. To improve assume something would happen when it's not the plan. That would be good I don't want it in the document. I don't even it's not it has nothing to do with a master plan for parks in Trout Tail in my mind. I guess one of the first thing years ago, one of the first things I got a lot of flack about was trying to save the sale of park property. And I fought it tooth and nail and eventually persuaded my fellow counselors to my, to at least the majority of them to my position. And I still feel that way. And I don't want revenues. I don't even want a reference to revenues from disposed park properties. So that's my suggestion. I also point out on page 21, if you look at 7.6, it says, consider charging a user fee for non Troutdale residents. I agree with both Councillor Glantz and Councillor White about adding the words consider on page 40. I, there, there it is on page 21. It's there. There's no harm in having it in there. And I think it softens the, uh, anyway, I agreed with both Councillor Glantz and Councillor White about the changes on page, page 40. I'd also, one other thing, um, on, on page 15, there, there's a reference to explore options for allowing on-leash dog access, <clears throat> access to parks. We're, we're doing the off-leash park. I, I, I think let's see how that goes. I realize this is a 20 year plan. We can always consider on leash access sometime, but I don't want it. I don't want it in our parks master plan that we're gonna explore on leash access to dogs in our parks. I, you know, they're, I love dogs. Don't get me wrong, but I, uh, I, let's try the off leash park. We finally got one. It's been fought for for years. Let's not get carried away. Where is that at? Page 15. Um, I just have it here. 1.7. Uh, 1.7. Yeah, 1.7. Uh, Mr. Mayor, full disclosure, um, if anybody's been watching the Parks Advisory Committee, they are actually discussing it now to come up with a possible recommendation for the council to consider. So it's something the citizens are talking about and they do want to consider, and the Parks Advisory Committee is just discussing that issue now. It's not an unlimited dogs everywhere in parks, but is there some way to balance needs of the citizens? But that, that's something they're just talking about. Just to understand, they are considering that issue right now. Well, I hate to get crosswise with the Parks Committee because they, they, they're dedicated volunteers as we all are, but uh, before we explore options for allowing on, anyway, I don't, I don't favor it being in the master plan. And I would suggest that be dropped. We're doing the off leash, uh, the, uh, off -leash park. And I, I favor that, but anyway, those were, those were my comments. I've been listening to some of that conversation and obviously can't comment during it, but yeah, having 
been knocked over by big dogs that break loose of the owner, you know, and come running at you and they're friendly, but they still knock you over and do other things. I'm not a fan of parks being on leash with dogs. I, will tell. I mean, there's kind of a tendency for people to, once they get in the park, to it's relax. Not doing it anyway. Yeah. One, so. Hey, just so we're clear, one person at a time. So that way we can right. actually make sense of what who's saying what. Um, I will say, I'll make a comment, though, that I was really surprised that this wasn't already in there. Um, I'll, I'll make a kind of a glib comment that Wood Village, 100% of their parks are on leash dog. But that's only they because park. they have one park. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I will say I'm in absolute support of uh, keeping it in and letting the parks committee go through it, uh, mull it over, vet it. And I would love to see Troutdale become more pet friendly uh, for, for families and neighbors. Um, I think comparing on leash rules to off, off leash dog parks is kind of apples and oranges. You know, you can't, you can't really compare one to the other. And my guess is the off leash park is going to be very busy and it would be more advantageous for us to have the community to have more parks to go to and explore more of our green spaces with their four legged family members uh, than telling them not to. Um, so I, I like keeping it in. Um, I, like I said, I was surprised we didn't allow it already. Councilor White. Yeah, I, I remember um, when you did the proclamation, council didn't like that you were kind of inviting parks or dogs anywhere in the town and we and we corrected that. Mm -hmm. So I think the majority of council might still agree. I agree with taking that out. Um, one of the reasons we picked Columbia Park for the dog park was because there's no there's no residents near there because you know there's good dog owners and there's bad dog owners and some people just let their dog bark nonstop. And um, the other thing is kind of a liability for the city. Maybe that's something after public comment, maybe we could take a vote on that one. <coughs> it's a good time, Councilor One, wants to say, just a good time to remind Council that just like the Parks Master Plan does not obligate the city to do anything, if you cut something out of the Master Plan like that, it doesn't stop the Parks Committee or the citizens from still considering it. <laughs> yeah, but it creates a lot of momentum. And um, if it's a bad idea, just like the um, camping at Glen Hour Park, that's our oversight, that's our job to pull those items. And I personally wouldn't have, have voted for the dog park if I had known the concept was going to be to allow dogs in every park. And uh, I, I grew up with dogs. I've had a dog my whole life. So it's like, but um, I know what it's like. And, and certain breeds of dogs can be pretty intimidating, especially to children. And you know, dog attacks do happen. So I just think it's something that we should vote on. But, I'll wait until after public comment. Yes, uh, I, just, yeah, and, and this is it. Nothing will change about our rules and the parks regarding dogs without the council voting on it. So that's it will always come before council does that change. So right. you'll have an opportunity to discuss it, debate that, make that decision at some future date if if parks advisory makes a recommendation to change our charter. <laughs> You know, I would also add uh, just some context with regards to the public involvement that it was one of the top findings in terms of community needs. The community is asking for parks that allow dogs and the plan does not suggest that it should be necessarily only off leash areas or only on leash. It gives the flexibility to explore a few different options for addressing those needs that were demanded by the public. It is what things we're seeing is one of the greatest trends in parks and recreation right now, besides pickleball, it's dogs in parks. So this is saying, you know, address this through your, your normal protocols to make sure this need is being met. Yep. Thank you, Cindy. I appreciate it. I'm going to ask everybody on Zoom to raise their hands and I will call on them so we don't get too many people talking over one another in virtual and then in person. Thank you very much. Councilor One. I just want to say one thing first is I think that I don't want to lose I don't think I want us to as a group to lose focus that this is like a an ideology or a plan like these are suggestions they're ideas and I, I think that having things in here to discuss and everything has to come back to us so 
having things in that I don't like is probably good because I wouldn't like them to be discussed and maybe persuaded a different way. So I, I, I don't want us to get too nitty gritty on this because I still feel like anything that would do would have to come back to us and we would have to approve it anyways. So also I think that this went through a rigorous process with the community and has things in here that maybe we have not heard of or thought about. And so I want to be respectful of that. And then just the second thing is that I can't disagree more with uh, a, couple, a couple of about the dogs. I think that uh, like I love to take my dog everywhere with me. Like she's part of our family. She's well trained. That's on me. I can't be responsible for other people and what they do with their dog. I can't. I can't demand that they tr train their dog. But I do feel like. I see it more and more, especially in Portland, in this area, that people value their dogs as part of their family and bringing them to the to a picnic at the park on leash is something that they should be able to do. And so I think that that needs to be included in here. And I think that it's something that we should strongly consider. I don't know what I didn't know that we can't bring our dogs to most parks or in Troutdale or Either whatever. Um, uh, but I think it's important to to keep that in discuss um, as a group um, at a later date and time whenever that recommendation comes. So, okay, Councilor Glantz. That was fast. Um, just a, a quick comment that I think it should stay in and I think it's reasonable to have it discussed, but I also think it's uh, important that if we have some strong opinions on that, that it's not like Park spends a lot of time, creates this great plan, and then it comes to council and we're like, heck no. Uh, so I think it's good that at some point we have a little bit more conversation. And I'd argue that the amount of trails that exist in Troutdale are more than adequate for a lot of dogs. And you know, there are people and children especially who are afraid of dogs. And I just don't think that that's where we should be headed with parks. Mr. Jonah Jacobson, our parks superintendent, welcome to the council meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I would just like to point out uh, from Councillor Glantz's uh, previous comment that many of the, the trails uh, that exist in um, the city of Troutdale uh, are in um, what the, the parks uh, master plan refers to as um, biological or ecologically sensitive areas. If you're talking about Beaver Creek, that is one of the areas that the Parks Division of Public Works has um, already been discussing to not allow dogs uh, because of the ecological impacts of dogs. Um, my only comments regarding the um, uh, permission of dogs within city parks, whether that is on leash or off leash, is that um, the Parks Division eagerly awaits direction from this council um, and uh, on, on this issue one way or the other. Um, and so do many citizens of, of the city. Um, I feel um, more concerns and complaints about the issue of dogs in parks than, than, than maybe anything else in the last um, six weeks that I, I have uh, uh, been in my position, which is not very long, but um, that issue has come up enough times that, uh, and I have had to recommend to enough citizens of Troutdale uh, that they participate in these meetings in the future and bring their concerns to this council um, because, uh, and, and, and their concerns are on both sides of the issue. Um, so uh, I would say that um, uh, whatever your decision may be, uh, the Parks Division eagerly awaits clear direction um, as to how to proceed with the issue of dogs, because at the moment um, there is um, some amount of ambiguity, especially after the, the pet friendly proclamation um, from the mayor's office. And so um, uh, people, people out in the city parks don't know exactly what the rules are and, and neither does the parks department. And we, we would like to post some clear signs uh, that tell people one way or another um what the rules are so um thank you very much that's thank all i have appreciate it i'll say you know that uh, i like uh, councillor one said it um i like having things in 
these master plans that I don't necessarily agree with because it invites conversation. It invites discussion. It invites the process of allowing our uh, various citizen committees to go through and chew it up and recommend to council what the community wishes and then allows us the opportunity to make that vote and make that decision. If we make this any more concrete, I believe we remove a lot of that potential for conversation. I don't necessarily agree with everything in it, but I do agree 100% when staff tells us that whatever decision that comes out of this master plan is going to come in front of our desk regardless, and we have to vote on that regardless. Um, I want to point out also that uh, Councilor Ritmus said he didn't want to necessarily step on Parks Committee's toes, but they've chewed this up and spit it out with a recommendation to approve it after looking at it twice. And it's gone through Planning Commission, and now it's come to us on a second time. Um, I think I would like us to approve this and move it forward tonight full well in knowing that we are the decision makers of what's going to come out of this plan and the direction we're going to give staff moving forward. This is not concrete. It's it's a big conversation document and it allows us to mull any decision coming forward uh, through our office before any shovel breaks ground. And so I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, I, I'd like us to, uh, like uh, Jonah, Jonah just stated, give a little bit more guidance not necessarily direction, guidance on what Troutdale should um, move forward towards. And again, it's all gonna come back in front of us. Uh, Councilor Caswell, thank you. Yeah, I, I uh, basically agree word for word for word with everything you just said. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to make my opinion on this known and supportive, basically word for word, everything you just said, so yeah. Thank you, Councilor Caswell. Uh, Councilor Wittron, do you have? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, first look looked at plans, look at it. I agree we should leave it in. Somewhere we're gonna find a middle ground on the dog piece. Because just because we don't have to approve it for all parks, but there's some people that want it. There's some people that don't. There's some people that want to go to the park and not have dogs running around and we should give that to them. There's some people that have dogs and one thing to the park. So at some point we're gonna to have to find a happy medium to make all your constituents happy, right? So if you figure that happy medium to make everybody <laughs> happy, <laughs> let us know. But but I think for now we live it in. It's a discussion point we're gonna have down the road. So this this document's been well vetted by a lot of people. So Councillor Ritman. Hearing you all, I am persuaded to drop the proposal to to change the page 15 item. Uh, I, I still worry, I don't know how who's going to enforce the on leash rules, but uh, I will drop my opposition to that and we'll just leave it the way it is. I still want my other ones, but not that one. Thank you, Councilor Ripp. Um, any other comments from Council before I open up the public hearing? Any other comments from staff before I open the public hearing? Any comments from uh, Mrs. Mendoza? Uh, Councillor Glantz. Yeah, I've been trying to track the changes. How did we end up on page 40 with uh, inserting consider? That one seemed, I've heard both sides and I'm not sure where we ended up. I'll, I'll reiterate what I just said. I'm not gonna reiterate what I just said, <laughs> but I'm fine with adding the word consider if it creates a softer approach in the title heading. Thanks. I'm absolutely fine doing that. And I think staff already said that's an easy fix. Mayor, and that was for consider the update of the park SDCs as well as consider increased park and facility maintenance staffing. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. That's right. yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Not seeing anything else. Let's go ahead and open up the public hearing. Uh, regarding an ordinance adopting the City of Troutdale Parks Master Plan and amending the Comprehensive Land Use Plan Goal 8 to include modifications to the summary overview reference to the 2023 Parks Master Plan and a new list of policies. Uh, let's start with Zoom. Anybody on Zoom wishes to make comment uh, regarding this agenda item, now's the time. Go ahead and raise your hand. I'll call on you and uh, state your name and city of residence for the record. 
All right, not seeing anybody. Anybody inside council chambers tonight? Let's go ahead. I'll have uh, Mr. Berniker. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shelly Reynolds, Troutdale. I'm also the chairperson of Parks Advisory. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes of your time to say thank you to the people who worked so hard on this plan. I was the chairperson through the entire project and we had many discussions and no arguments and we had many objections all done with kindness and respectfulness. It was an amazing experience and what you have before you is a document that is to open conversations to say that all of us agreed on everything in that document would be a major stretch. <laughs> <laughs> to say that we all agreed that with the soft words and the especially consideration uh, for with further citizen involvement with further information with further involvement from the parks advisory committee we all agreed that it was time to move this project forward and so to say thank you to the my fellow parks committee members um, i also want to say thank you to retired park superintendent tim siri he was an invaluable source of information he was our cheerleader he was he was the one to keep us moving forward and then finally to John Fenus and his never ending patience with us as we made changes day in and day out on this thing. Um, regarding dogs in the park, <laughs> we're gonna go there. Um, just for a, a brief moment, uh, our understanding was that that was actually a city thing and not necessarily just a park thing, um, that dogs were coming to our parks, whether we wanted them or not. So it's in there. Now that said, I don't think too many of us disagreed with it because all of us kind of came to terms with the fact that people are gonna do it anyway. Uh, I live on a park, I live on Llewellyn Park. Uh, it's a no dog park, has been a no dog park since I moved in. And there are dogs there every day, off leash, on leash, every day. For the most part, they're pretty respectful and, and we have no objections. They don't bark. Um, but just so you know that enforcement, if you if you say no, you have to be prepared to enforce it. Otherwise, it's it's just a parent saying no with no slap on the wrist, right? It's it's ineffective. Um, so thank you. I've said my thank you. Thank you to the Planning Commission for going through every word. Thank you to all of you for for going through every word and being so diligent. Uh, and thank you for considering moving this forward. Thank you, Shelly. Yes. Thank you for your service to the community. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, question, Shelly. Uh, let's go ahead and finish the public hearing and then uh, we'll move forward with questions immediately after that. Uh, yeah, next person. Hey, Diane Castillo White. I'm on a few committees. I'm here as a citizen. And um, for uh, page 15, item 1.7, pertaining to dogs. Um, I Sunrise Park, it works. There's not 22 picnic tables like Glen Auto Park, three covered shelters, two large barbecues, two small barbecues, a playground, a, um, a venue for weddings, quinceaneras, and events that are outdoors. So there's kind of a unique situation going on in Glen Auto Park where um, there's a lot of food. The dogs have been seen um, jumping on the tables. Um, there's, I was at a wedding that was outside, gowns, dresses, everything. So not a good place for somebody not to have cleaned up. Um, the observances have been that when people come in with the dog on leash, 50% uh, of them are off. The signs are uh, confusing because um, at the, or the picnic area, there's signs that says no dogs. And then there's signs that say dogs on leash only. There's also two poop bag stations. Um, I was at the beach today and some people came from that portion of the park, came down a different path with their two dogs. 
And um, so they had to have gone past the, uh, one sign that's going down the trail that has about uh, thou shall not eat things. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things you, you can't do down there. One of them was no dog. So um, it, it looked like that, that somebody had created an effort to allow leash dogs only in that section. Um, so we're, like we're saying that all parks are different. I agree, like Jordan was saying, it might work some places, it might not work others. Um, the other thing are, besides uh, all the weddings and the events and everything that's, that's up there, um, the beach portion. For the lifeguards, if there's a dog and a child, they have to be in the water. There's, it's just like a situation can arise that um, when dogs get tired, they're exhausted, they look for the highest place and they, my dog has done this to me a lot of times, come on me and pushing me down. So that, that's a situation there. Um, living on the water by the park, I've seen um, pit bulls and German shepherds bite and stuff. Um, there's, there is, dogs are allowed on the west side of the Sandy River. They're, they're always across. And people already know to, if they're going to usually to bring a dog, they do it there. And then also Lewis and Clark Park in that beach as well, along with the trail system that goes to a thousand acres or it goes around to the uh, it goes around to the outlets. Um, so I don't think there's a burden for in that area for dogs to be uh, off leash, but there's just to me there's a lot of situations where um, uh, dogs present at Glen Auto doesn't work now. In addressing sugar pine, sugar pine does a lot of advertisement saying dog friendly and dog welcome. I propose to them if we must do dogs there that um, there's this green space that's between their um, kind of their trailer behind their their eating establishment and the uh, the lifeguard of uh, the uh, AMR statue. There's that green space there, so I I would recommend that you say dogs only here because they already bring in their dogs and it, I don't think it's fair for a dog not to have an area to relieve themselves coming from somewhere else of people coming to sugar pine and then wanting an opportunity to use sugar pine so to me that would be uh, uh, an idea as a uh, uh, that would work um, looking at Glen Auto Park I looked at the trail system as well um, I believe that the best vista and views are along the uh, where the picnic tables currently are at Sugar Pine. Before we used to have a about a seven foot or eight foot uh, area that there was no picnic tables. I believe Sugar Pine could move their picnic tables a little bit closer towards their drive through. There's already some there. They can move the other ones out on the fence closer because I think we should um, have that as a path area again. That's a a really great way to go visit the the uh, Sandy River and to also to observe the vistas and also there's there's kind of regulations on uh, top of slope where there can even be a picnic table but I had recommended to Chris a long time ago let sugar pine put picnic tables there we get to use it they get to use it it's a win-win so I'm just suggesting picnic tables get moved a little bit and then we we retain that as a pathway to a safe pathway to get to the uh, the Sandy River Bridge, come around, and then go to the park and explore other areas. Um, also, the park, um, the entrance to the uh, the picnic area is uh, it's it's not very inviting, and also the ways to walk to get to that are confusing too. When there's events and things going on there, I just think that the way uh, people walk through the uh, parking area it's it's very confusing and it's not safe on a busy day on Saturday or Sunday there's a lot line of cars trying to park into Glen Auto Park there's an entrance into the drive through there's an exit out of the drive through and um, I've taken the four grandchildren with my daughter and it's it's just not it doesn't look like it's safe for anyone and I've kind of kind of mapped out something I have a little drawing so when that conversation one minute. okay when that conversation comes up I I have some Thoughts, I know uh, Marley would be great at it, of course, uh, to aesthetically and with signage and everything else. I, I think we need to take away the confusion from the park though right now, because people don't know if they can or they can't at Glen Auto. I'm, I'm thinking that Glen Auto is not a good place to have dogs uh, just because of the swimming and the events and the 22 picnic tables 
but again, have a little respite area for sugar pine and, and some compromise there. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Anybody else wishing to make comment? All right. If I may, um, just let me just, let me go ahead and close public comment first. Okay. Public comment is now closed. Mr. Jacobson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, just in in response to the the previous comment, um, staff staff recommends um, in in our drafts of any any dog. Uh, um ordinances that that might come before council um in the future staff recommends that uh dogs be excluded from um from areas such as glen auto um uh um both uh, you know uh for the reasons that that uh were previously mentioned in terms of, of safety uh, but also for ecological reasons and and in terms of, of sanitation um so you know any any um any recommendations you see from the staff going forward will 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 say that uh, Glen Auto Park and and the riverfront uh, area will not be open to dogs. Mr. Ray Young, rest assured, Council, that any details will be reserved on a council meeting somewhere down the road for all of the details of dogs or not dogs or where dogs will be fully discussed in this room. So know that whatever comes out of the Parks Advisory Committee, we will set up a time for council to spend plenty of time talking about it because it is a hot issue on both sides and we appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Glantz. Yep, I just wanted to ask uh, Shelly a question. Am I allowed to do that? Yeah, you can ask. I'm just wondering if she's okay uh, as the Parks Chairman with the changes that we have suggested so far. Will you pull the microphone a little closer to you? Absolutely, Sandy, um, Councilor Glantz, it, it's, th this really is a document for discussion. And when I say that not all of us agreed on everything in the document, that is absolutely true. And we don't expect all of you to agree with everything in the document either. We put it forward knowing that there were, there would be things that people pulled out uh, and that uh, it would be changed to some degree. Uh, so yeah, I have I have no problem. I see Carol Allen is also on on and and could probably answer that question uh, as well. But speaking for myself, I I don't see that any changes you've made is is of concern. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you again. Do I have any other comments or questions from Council? Just a comment, Council White. Uh, you know I. I'm glad Shelly brought up Tim Seary too, because he, he did do a lot of this work and uh, I, I'm personally gonna miss him. He did, he did a great job for us. He was a parks champion. He was. All right. Not that we don't love you, Jonah. <laughs> Not that Jonah, Jonah's just got a big, uh, he's got a big uh, uh, rake to, to work while Tim is gone, so good luck no, with that. No, no offense, no offense taken. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I um, very much enjoyed Tim for the short time that I knew him as well. So. <laughs> okay. So, uh, if there's no other comments or questions, uh, any other comments from staff? Would you like me to kind of go through the comments? Actually, let's go ahead and do that. Thank you. Okay. So, just for clarity what i heard was that on starting with page 17 that section 3.1 and cindy mendoza had some ideas like getting cat all about how to reward that first statement so reward it or maybe she can just repeat that um cindy do you have it there written uh yes on 3.1 we'll reword it to say identify areas of environmental significance parentheses, wetland sensitive species and habitat to minimize impacts associated with new development where feasible. And I think technically, Mayor, we'd be doing this as laying out what the amendments would be so that it can be approved tonight with the following amendments. And that would be one. Okay. Sarah, you have that? Okay. Uh, the second one was discussed was on page 21, the removal of 7.4. Minus 7.4. That was the 
disposed parkland that's correct. revenue okay um, the next item was on page 40 and there was two items adding the word consider to each headings consider increased parking facility maintenance staffing levels number one number two consider updating park system sdc's <coughs> Okay. Then the final one I had was where we started, which was on page 52, which is adding to the bottom of the page in the italics, talking about the nine million plus um, mount is to include grant funding. I have the actual uh, wording on that. This amount includes grant funding. This Perfect. amount includes grant funding. Sarah's got it. Thank That's you, Mr. Berniker. Yeah. I think that encompasses everything that we talked about. So uh, with that being said, Councilor Ritma. With that being said, I would move adoption of the resolution with the amendments just, just described. Uh, and the resolution is a resolution providing for a supplemental budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Is that right? Actually, Councilor Ritma, that's uh, oh, right. uh, item number four. I'm, I'm on the wrong thing. Yes. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, an <laughs> ordinance adopting the city of Troutdale Park's master plan and amending the comprehensive land use plan, goal eight to include modifications to the summary order overview, reference to the 2023 parks master plan and a new list of policies. Second. All right, Sarah. Here we go. Councilor Caswell. Yes. Councilor One. Yes. Mayor Lauer. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Wittrin. Yes. Councilor Glantz. Yes. Councilor Ritma. Yes. Passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, this discussion. Thank you to staff. Thank you to our committees. Without your guidance, we would we would not be done tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. But that's what this is all about. Councilor White. Yeah. If, um, once the, we get a final printout with the corrections, it would it be possible to get a, a copy of that? I would love that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to agenda item number five, our second public hearing of the evening, a resolution providing for a supplemental budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 budget transfers and making appropriation changes. Mr. Mueller, welcome this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, Although I was hopeful there that Council Ritma was just going to take care of it for me there a second ago, you know. I was getting ahead of myself. It would have been all done, but, you know, anyway, okay. Careful, he'll say move to adjourn. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, well, uh, the uh, item, uh, this agenda item is, uh, for those of you that have been on the Council, you know, is a perennial one that I bring to the council the last council meeting uh, scheduled for the fiscal year, which is uh, this evening's meeting. Uh, it's a supplemental budget and budget transfers. Uh, sometimes it doesn't include a supplemental budget, just depends on the nature of the activity during the course of the year. Uh, but we have uh, gone through the process of getting the supplemental budget uh, notice and publication uh, published in the Gresham Outlook as required by the local budget law. Uh, this. Uh, item takes care of the transfers uh, within funds and between funds from contingency to other divisions. Uh, it's to deal with the what in the local budget law terminology is referred to as the unanticipated and necessary expenditures that uh, occurred that, uh, that hadn't occurred when the uh, anticipated at the time the budget had been adopted. Uh, as I uh, recapped, of course, in the uh, staff report, the background and so forth, but the uh, this budget that we're adjusting for the final three days uh, of this uh, fiscal year uh, was, of course, considered by the budget committee uh, uh, more than 15 months ago. So there, of course, has been a lot of actual occurrence versus what might have been planned or uh, an anticipated or expected to occur over the course of uh, 
the subsequent 15 months. Uh, this addresses uh, fixing uh, those differences between what we thought would happen and what did happen in uh, various different areas. Uh, the uh, budget law expects and provides for this process. There's a, a whole section of it just dealing with uh, with transfers to uh, to be dealt with after uh, after adoption. Uh, I went through and uh, as as is typical, outlined the uh, the specifics in the staff report uh, that are supported then in the uh, in the resolution. Um, deals with uh, adjusting items uh, overall uh, in each of the funds they'll still be well under budget in uh, in all cases uh, once the transfers that have been accomplished uh, you will note that i i usually make mention each year that one of the first few years that i was in this role i missed doing one uh, item and there was uh, we were more than two hundred thousand, i think under budget for that particular fund and one of the individual buckets uh, was over budget by 1400 and of course the auditors wrote me up for that so some of these transfers are to make sure that I don't stub my toe in that regard again. Uh, in any case, I am happy to address any uh, questions that the Council may have on uh, that which was uh, outlined in the staff report. Um, Councilor Glantz. Uh, yes, can you speak a little bit to the transfer we're making that ties to Old City Hall, just for public record? Uh, yes, the uh, the sale of Old City Hall was accomplished uh, for $435,000. Form of payment was in two, uh, two forms, $1,000 uh, cash, and then uh, the remainder was in the form of essentially a, a, a note carryback. Uh, um, and uh, so the process of getting that on the balance sheet. Uh, it went on on one side, which increased the fund balance as a result of the accounting side. This accounts for the, uh, the provision of the development incentive credits the council provided as part of that transaction. And then that then there matches it so that we don't distort the fund balance by saying that we have $435,000 $434, more cash laying around, which we don't really. Um, uh, so really all this is, is I, as we as I tried to describe in the staff report, is, uh, is the accounting and bookkeeping uh, part of the process. Uh, and just to uh, reassure you, there was uh, no $434,000 of cash that went out the door as a part of this process. So. And just for uh, new counselors, the reason we did that was it was uh, we wanted to be able to keep City Hall in some form or another, and the cost to renovate it outweighed any benefit of us trying to charge for it. All right. Any other comments or questions from council? Okay. Let's go ahead and open up. Council White, you good? Yeah. Let's go ahead and open up public hearing. Public hearing is now open regarding a resolution providing for a supplemental budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 budget transfers and making appropriation changes. Uh, anybody on Zoom wishes to make comment, now is the time. Go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you. State your name and city of residence for the record. All right, not seeing anybody. Anybody in council chambers? Mr. Uh, uh, let's go, Mr. Wilcox. It's all, it's your show tonight. Well, Wilcox trial down. Um, my PC is down, so I wasn't able to print. So now I'm digital tonight. <laughs> Just like you guys. I'll get you a sticker this, for the back. This is, this is very different. <laughs> Okay, um, there's one, one section I had a question about. Uh, page three, paragraph three of the staff report, and I quote, a budget transfer from contingency to ensure budget compliance for unanticipated necessary additional expenses of the restaurant incentive of the sewer infrastructure, system development charge subsidy, Wayfinder beer development of the Highlands Tap House beer garden and food truck pods. 
transferring $63,000 from contingency to tourism and economic development division. Uh, related to that, I have two comments. Number one, the two new counselors might not be familiar with this program, which by the way, expires on Friday. And number two, why is the $63,000 transferred to tourism and economic development rather than the sewer fund? And there's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. I appreciate it. Anybody else? Oh, no. Miss, no. All right. Let's go ahead and close public hearing. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I assume you'd like me to address the questions raised during public comment. There is nothing more that I would enjoy. <laughs> Actually, I lie. I would enjoy dinner. I would enjoy dinner more, but <laughs> please, Eric. Uh, the uh, $63,000, uh, the expense side of providing the uh, incentive uh, development, the sewer SDC credit uh, for the Wayfinder beer uh, and uh, Highlands tap outs, which of course is right across the street from us, uh, the construction going on right there on the uh, outside our meeting room here. Uh, the expense side of that is booked in the tourism and economic development division. So that's why it's referenced there in terms of we've moved the uh, expenditure, the appropriation authority into that division in order to incur the expense. And then the revenue side of it, just as Mr. Wilcox was inquiring about why doesn't it go to the, uh, the sewer fund? Well, that's the other side. That's the credit side. So the essentially the debit or the charge side is uh, where the expense is, what the the budget law focuses on is the expense side and then the revenue side is is going into the sewer fund to pay for that sewer SDC charge that the program paid for rather than the developer paid. Okay. Sufficient. Any other comments or questions from Council? Any discussion amongst staff? All right. Then I would entertain a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we adopt the resolution for the supplemental budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 budget transfers and the making appropriation changes. A second. Seconded by Councillor. Motion moved by Councillor Wittrin, seconded by Councillor One. I got it right this time. <laughs> okay, Councillor Caswell. Yes. Councillor One. Yes. Mayor Lauer. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Wittrin. Yes. Councillor Glantz. Yes. And Councillor Ritma. Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, let's move on to agenda item number six, a resolution to unify the name of the North South Road King 257th Graham to 257th Avenue. Uh, and I believe we have a correct, well, Mr. Berniker, we have Mr. Berniker back again. But we also had a revised resolution. So it took out Southwest 257th, correct? Correct. And entered Southeast. That is correct. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. It's, I think it's believe, I, I believe it's on section or paragraph yep. two. It's on number, number, five. number five. Number five. It's on two as well, Southwest 257th Drive. Okay. Continue. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, um, thank you. This is this is the second council meeting to re to rename the street segment between Southeast Stark Street and Grab Graham Avenue to Two Fifty Seven Avenue. And um, as we talked about last time, Two Fifty Seven currently exhibits a patchwork of street names, and this patchwork has led to inconsistencies in addressing and wayfinding. Adoption of this project will result in a more reliable street system, making travel easier for residents, businesses, and tourists, as well as critically important first responders. Um, at the first meeting on June 13, several council members wanted to make sure that the affected properties were provided with a notice of change before it was voted on. Um, to that end, staff mailed to the 36 property addresses that would be impacted a letter informing them of the change um, with the map. And so we made that correction and sent out the noticing. So 
that's the extent of my report. Did we hear anything back from anybody? We did hear back from some folks that were on the Graham Street, which is kind of telling because that's why we need to go through this to get it to a singular address to 257 mm -hmm. Avenue. Okay. Was there anybody that was no. coming to your office? No. Screaming, yelling, <laughs> no. kicking in the window? No, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, comments from council? Councilor Glantz? Just so I'm clear, it's going to be called 257th Avenue and there won't be a Southeast or a Southwest. It'll be 257 Southeast South 257th. Yes, yeah, Southeast 257th Avenue. The entire stretch. Correct. Okay. That confusion came because in that resolution on it states Southwest 257th and so that was just a typo in the resolution. So we got a revised draft of that. Uh, Mr. Travis Holton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to make a, a quick clarification there. The, the prefix will be based on the, the normal quadrant system of the city. So this passes through one of those dividing lines. So there, there is not gonna be one prefix for the entire stretch it'll it will have the same prefix assigned to other roads in that quadrant and that dividing line is columbia river highway correct the dividing lines in troutdale for our quads are uh, columbia river highway and uh, buxton slash troutdale road so columbia river highway is north south buxton troutdale road is east west so what are the two variations? You will have, let me think about this for a second. You will have Northwest and Southwest. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, Councilor Ritma. I, I just wanted to be, uh, you, uh, Mr. Brinker, the, uh, the comments from people on Graham Road were not negative. They nobody objected to this change. That is that what I understood. I did. I didn't hear you say that. Right. There were no. There were no people objecting to a counselor. There was a couple of um, envelopes sent back. Okay. And and people. Some people asked questions about it. Maybe. That's did not fine. hear anything, sir. Oh, so a couple, a, a couple were returned undelivered. And nobody made any comment or question. That is correct. All right, I'm satisfied with that. Thank you, Councilor Glantz. Did I just hear Southwest and Northwest, or is it Southeast and Northeast? <laughs> it will be Southwest and Northwest because the entire stretch is west of Buxton slash Troutdell Road, or the the projection thereof to the north. Yeah. Thank you. Did I say the wrong thing earlier? I think I did. I did. That's my that's my screw up. I apologize. Uh, Sarah, did you have your hand? I was up? just gonna say the, the correction was for Stark Street. It was noted as southwest, but it should have been southeast. That's maybe where the confusion is. That's where goes. the confusion is. I apologize. I added to that confusion. <laughs> on, number, the, the, on number five. On number right. five. Yeah. That's my Paragraphs fault. two and three of the resolution are correct when it says currently designated southwest 257th between Stark and the Columbia River Highway. And then north of Columbia River Highway, it's called northwest. So, so when so we get the, the resolution is correct. When we get those minutes back, I, I would love for it to just be a solid black line as Mayor Lauer states, and then just read like the CIA came through. For summary do minutes, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Glance. Apologies. Anything else, Councillor White? Yeah, I was just going to say that I appreciate Councillor Ritma's um, suggestion of contacting those addresses and staff's willingness to do it because that we had a big. Um, problem last time we did this with Cherry Park. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. 
if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to public comment and we'll end the evening soon after that. Public comment is now open regarding a resolution to unify the name of the North South Road, uh, Kane 257th Graham to 257th Avenue. If you are on Zoom and wish to make a comment, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, not seeing anybody. Anybody in council chambers? Mr. Wilcox. Paul Wilcox, Troutdale. Uh, it's been way briefer than two weeks ago. Uh, it's beat him. Okay. It's all that my suggested edits were findings number two and number three were adopted. I also wanted to give extra credit to staff for correcting an error in number six that I had missed. Number six finding from two weeks ago had assigned Northwest Graham Road from Historic Highway to Northwest Frontage Road to Wodot. Well, the jurisdiction map shows that section under Multnomah County's authority. We have a sense in here about the uh, correction on finding number five, which sounds like you've taken care of already. Well, then they go on to further little aside here, actually. There's one other problem area on the 257th quarter that I wanted to address. When Councilor White mentioned Cherry Park at the last meeting, I thought he would be referring to the disjointed nature of that road. Instead, he was talking about the difficulty in changing someone's address which was discovered when the city attempted to renumber certain properties on Cherry Park. That was a very valid concern considering the public opposition in that instance. I would think that changing the street name entirely would be a bigger deal than changing the address number. In the case of Cherry Park, there are two, dis two disconnected nonlinear sections. Let's say I'm a local rep. I, let's say I'm not a local resident. I have to call 911 for an injury accident at 257th and Cherry Park. Will the dispatcher know whether I'm talking about the post office Cherry Park or the high school Cherry Park? There are also numerous segmented streets throughout the city that could be problematic for first responders. There you go, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Appreciate it. <laughs> Councilor uh, White. If I may. Um... Uh, let me close public comment. Public comment is closed. Yeah, we, we did check with the, I'm on the fire user board and they said they have no, no issues responding to those addresses with the system they have okay. on their trucks. Okay. All right, any other comments or questions for staff from council? All right, if not, I would entertain another motion. I'll make a motion. For a resolution to unify the name of the North South Road, Kane 257th Graham to 257th Avenue. I will second. All right. <clears throat> Councillor Caswell. Yes. Councillor One. Yes. Mayor Lauer. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Wittrin. Yes. Councillor Glantz. Yes. And Councilor Ritma. Yes. Unanimous. What is that? One, two, three, four for four tonight. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Berniker. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good job, everybody. Agenda item number seven, staff communications, Mr. Ray Young. Thank you, Mayor. Number one, uh, next Tuesday, of course, is uh, 4th of July and city offices will be closed uh, a week from today. Number two, but that following Friday will be first Friday, July 7th. Please put it on your calendar. We should have another great event on July 7th for first Friday for July. And finally, it was mentioned earlier and I mentioned it last time, but I got a chance to go out there uh, the other day is the fence is almost up for the uh, um, off-leash dog park. It's gonna be kind of cool. They're very popular in other communities in metro area and the fence is almost up. And so that's kind of nice to see that area which has been pretty much unused by the citizens will now be available for the citizens and their four-legged friends. And that's all I have, Mayor. All right. Uh, Council Communications, Councillor Caswell. 
Yeah, can't get this button to work. I'm nothing for me. All right, thank you. Uh, who do I got? Councilor one. Make, I don't want to make it like three times in a row where I don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to say thank you to like the parks department and uh, I believe his name is, I think his name is Jason that like mows all the time. I was him at the park. He's super friendly. He, I go walk and sunrise all the time. Uh, it's always a uh, nice little when we see each other, give each other a wave. He uh, keeps the park clean emptying the garbage cans and I just feel like uh, the people who mow our parks and take care of them uh, deserve a little, a little thanks and appreciation as friendly faces for people who go in there so I just wanted to just want to say that awesome thank you sir uh, let's go to Councilor White yeah um, I noticed in the Gresham Outlook an article about um, for the first time ever a burn ban in, in Troutdale and they were talking about you know, just like someone's patio fire pit. And I was surprised because it doesn't seem that dry. And where I live, the mosquitoes are so bad, it's really helpful to have a little patio fire. Have the smoke. Or you cannot be outside. Uh, that was my other comment. Is there is there anything happening on the mosquito epidemic? Are they going to spray or do any anything at all? I know that vector control, and I think. Um, Travis, if he's not on anymore, I will ask them to check with Multnomah County to find out what their plans are because that is who's responsible for uh, yeah. control. Maybe we could follow up on that um, burn ban. I do know that burn ban, Travis. I'll get you in just a second. That burn ban is county countywide, so yeah, well, yeah it's not something that the city that. implemented. It's right. something no, no, the county yeah. implemented. It's been very mild temperatures and really yeah. great, great summer. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Holton, Public Works Director, Travis Holton. Yeah, uh, to Councilor White's question, uh, my recommendation would be to go on the Multnomah, Multnomah County Vector Control website. They have some bulletins posted there about what they're doing. Uh, I know they are applying some um, insecticides in certain areas, I think along, along the SLU and some other areas, um, select locations. I would also take this opportunity to tell you about their mosquito fish program. They offer free mosquito fish to folks that have uh, ponds on their property. They cannot be connected to any surface waters, but if you have a, a pond that is isolated, um, you can get free mosquito fish from them that eat mosquito larvae and help keep the population down. I've taken advantage of that service myself. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Witcher. Um, other than the neighbors, the neighborhood, we're excited about First Friday again and looking forward to it. It's a great community event. Yeah, I can't wait. So that's all I have. Councilor Glantz. I have one item. I'll see if that's got this postcard about streets. And it's like you can't park on a day and you have to use a QR code in order to get more information. And I'm pretty sure there are at least two sitting councilors that don't have smartphones and wouldn't be able to do that. And there's a fair amount of our population that wouldn't be able to do that as well. That's I a good appreciate trying to save money. I really do. And I'm just a little concerned about it. If I was not able to use a QR code and got this in the mail, I would be very concerned. My flip phone broke. So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't have a smartphone. Public Works Director, Mr. Travis Holton. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Councilor Glantz. No, certainly, normally we, we would put additionally put the, the URL for the webpage on there. Um, that may have been an oversight this time. We'll have to take a look at that. Uh, but of course, you can always go to the city website and find that web page. That's where that QR code is going to take you. Um, so uh, we will certainly take a look at that and make sure we don't have that oversight again if that occurred. And folks can always call us, of course, as well. Yeah, I was going to say at the very least, maybe the public work, maybe your office phone number, that would be a, I think that would be appropriate. 503-674-3300. <laughs> <laughs> It would be Dr. nice. Public to project manager or myself. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. I appreciate it. Councilor Ritma, don't adjourn. I'm going last. You are? Yeah. <laughs> that was exactly what I intended to do. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have no. I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Okay. I was going to say happy 4th of July. Be safe. Uh, try not to use illegal fireworks. Use good fireworks. Enjoy this time with family and friends. Celebrate this country and enjoy First Friday. I move we adjourn. Second. Seconded by <laughs> Councillor White. <laughs>
All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, everybody, we are done. Have a good night. Thank you very much for the discussion. Fantastic.